Are we on, Owen? Good morning, everybody. Uh, here at St. Andrew's St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church, we have our kind of our, our almost usual about 15 people here this morning. It's great to see you here spaced out. And uh, it's great to be with you wherever you are on the Zoom call this morning as we join together for, uh, for worship. And um, I'm just going to, we're going to go straight into our worship. There's going to be a couple of announcements a little bit later on, but we'll, uh, we'll go straight into worship this morning. So I would invite everyone to light those candles again that we've been doing every Sunday going through this, just as that sign that God is with us. Uh, that kind of idea of a Christ candle being the light in the center of us. But as we light them together, we are lighting them together, that idea that we are a community of faith. So I would encourage you now to light your candles as we join together in worship. It's uh, our pleasure to have uh, Ross with us this morning, Reverend Dr. Ross Lockhart. Don't think, oh, we can they can actually see you waving because uh, they can see the front row uh, with us this morning. Ross is going to be preaching later on this morning. But um, I always kind of, uh, when, when I invite Ross to kind of come and preach, it's an opportunity for me to uh, see if any of the rest of the family would be involved. And so I reached out to Emily to see if she would actually come and be involved this morning. And so Emily's going to come and lead us in our work. Worship, uh, because I call the worship an opening prayer this morning. So, Emily, over to you. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 126, a song of ascent as pilgrims made their way up to, Jeru to Jerusalem to worship God. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the, in the Negev. Those who sow with tears and reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Let us pray. God, our Father, you have filled the world with beauty. Open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. Lord Jesus, we pray for your blessing on your church in this place. Here may the faithful find salvation and the distracted be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Come, O Holy Spirit, into our hearts to rule and direct us according to your will, to comfort us in all our temptations and afflictions, to defend us from all error and lead us into all truth, that we being steadfast in the faith may increase in love and in all good works and in the end obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Ben, thanks, Emily, for coming to lead us this morning. What a great little phrase. What was it, Emily? The distracted being awakened. What a lovely um, but challenging thought, how many of us are distracted right now with so many things going on uh, in the world, in our lives, and to be awakened. Almost just, I, I, it's funny, I had lunch with Todd Weeb this, uh, this week, a couple of days ago, and I just, I, it just popped into my head. I just feel if Todd was here, I could see Todd encouraging us just to dwell on that phrase right now. Um, for all of us to pray to God that we would be awakened um, today and in the days, weeks, months that lie ahead. 
Thanks, Emily, for coming and leading us this morning uh, in our worship. Uh, over the past uh, number of months, we've been doing um, an interview. We haven't been doing as many of them over the past few weeks, but um, we, uh, working with our mission and evangelism ministry team, have decided we're going to use one of those Sundays per month and use the interview slot to interview one of our missionaries, because most of the missionaries that we support are now at home. Um, they're not actually on the mission field as such. I shouldn't say that in front of Ross because I know he will correct me later, but you know what I mean. Physically, they're not actually there. And so we are going to invite the MEMT team um, to use the interview slot and touch base. So this morning, I'm going to welcome uh, Joseph back. He's going to come up and join me in the hot seat on the, on the stools. Great, great to see you. And everybody can see you as well. Are you, are you on? Oh, you're not online. So you get, I'm going to just put this there so that you get to see what everybody else is seeing. Okay. Good to, good to have you uh, with us this morning. Uh, you've been on the MEMP team now for a while. And so you kind of got that, you drew the short straw to be coming and doing the first one of these, but it's great to have you here. Good to be here. And uh, we are hopefully going to have Mo Blackman online this morning. Mo, um, you should be able to un mute yourself and turn your video on. Can we get to see you? Hello. Hi. Hi, Wes. I can see you as well, brother, in the background. You're looking good. Let me, let me just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a wee selfish look. Uh, say hello to me again to get to see you. Hello. Hi, Wes. Look, looking good, brother. Thanks. Look. Nothing wrong with your eyes. You keep, you keep promising to come over and see me, but uh, you come up with some weird excuse, like there was a COVID pandemic that you kept you away. But uh, So don't forget your invite to come here anytime. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm going to listen up. I'm not the one supposed to be uh, speaking to you, so I'm going to hand over to Joseph and uh, so that he can get a chance to chat to you. Uh, good morning. Our morning, thoughts from the MENT team are with you. We've been pondering over these past number of months the particular challenges, the many challenges that those in the mission field have been facing as a result of the COVID pandemic. So we've wanted to find an opportunity to both touch base and to inquire as to how things are, how things are progressing and the challenges you're facing. So uh, starting from that premise, that outline, how the good people of Latvia, for example, and the Christian community found ways to meet in faith through this pandemic? That's an awesome question. And Joseph, can I just say a quick hello first? Of course. Hello, church family. <laughs> we miss you guys so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Yuna, for this amazing shawl. It's absolutely stunning. What a beautiful treat. So the good people of Latvia. Well, um, one thing that they're they're doing, they're meeting together in faith, very similar to all of us. They're they're doing live streaming and they're doing Zoom. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting with how they do their live stream and Zoom services is that after the live stream, they all gather in Zoom. And I, I'm thinking of one church in particular that I'm very connected with in Latvia. And every Sunday, they put them in random meeting rooms on Zoom so that uh, every Sunday, they're connecting, um, talking about the sermon, talking about each, sharing life and praying together with eight different people in the church family. And, of course, the extroverts love it, and the introverts are really challenged <laughs> to love it. But um, that, that, I thought, was a very neat idea and uh, a very cool way to, to be interacting with more and different people than you would usually. Okay. Building on that, are there particular ways in addition to using Zoom that the Latvian community are communicating and leading in faith during these challenging times? There's so much that can be said. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I thought was interesting as well, um, as a denomination, so the denomination that I work with there as a whole, they have decided to have a united theme this fall. And so all churches in this denomination, it's Baptist group, 
they are studying one thing. So they're studying um, something new Rick Warren has put out, 40 Days in the Word, where many different Bible teachers will share uh, each day something from the Word. And so the churches in the whole country are doing this. And then um, they are meeting in Bible studies to study during the week, whether that's on Zoom or carefully together in person. And I really love this part. Um, all the different pastors of the churches then will take whatever day they're on and they preach themselves from their heart, from their culture, from their experience on that scripture. So I thought that was a really interesting way that a, a group of churches countrywide are they're trying to be united around God's word. Well, that's lovely to hear. How have you and Wes, though, in particular, brought yourselves closer to God during this time when travel to support your mission work has proved to be impossible? <clears throat> um, for myself, personally, um, I think it's uh, not been so much how I have have I drawn myself closer to God as, as much as how God has drawn, drawn me closer to him? Um, I have a, <clears throat> a part-time job with a construction company as their safety officer. And um, I took uh, two months off when this COVID thing first hit, uh, just at the recommendation that because my health was kind of compromised in a few ways already. And then uh, after two months, I, I decided that, okay, it's time to go back. And uh, uh, God had already, they were already paved the way for me to go back there. And the first day when I walked back in uh, <clears throat> to one of the, into the officers, two of the guys, one of them piped up and says, oh, the preacher's back. <laughs> So, um, God has actually made the way for us to draw closer. And in the meantime, he's uh, opened up tremendous opportunities there for me to pray for different people. That's nice to hear. And yourself, and, Mo? Yeah. I, I had a similar thought that, boy, there's nothing spectacular I've done to draw close to God, but you know, the same meeting with him in the morning and um, and just finding him and his word and prayer and worship. But uh, I think the challenge for me has been to really believe what I, I believe in my head, that God is in control. Um, that's really been shaken up and challenged, as I'm sure it has been for all, all of you um, in different areas. But I am a bit of a control freak, and I love to plan years in advance. <laughs> and, of course, I've had to let that be crucified, um, had to let that go. Um, and it's been a while that God has been teaching me to trust him with, with hard things, things that are hard in my life. Um, and that's really been ramped up. But I, as I've been thinking about this, um, I think it's really been more a year of adventure in Okay, I think we're going to do this. I wonder what God's going to say at the end of the day. And, you know, Latvia was canceled for me. And then just days before the training was supposed to happen last week, they realized they had to cancel as well. Then I thought, okay, I'll help in Fargo. We're setting up a new training center in Fargo. Uh, kind of a big deal there. Oh, border's still closed. I'm not going to Fargo. Oh, God decided to do something local. So we have. We have eight members of our local church taking this uh, this leadership training starting in one week. So it's been more of an adventure and less freaking out than I thought. And uh, glory to God for that. We are all very blessed by the mission work that both of you do in spite of the challenges that you're facing and the perseverance that you're showing to support the community in Latvia especially. Is the particular verse and why that leads you into deeper faith and trust in God's mercy and blessing during this time when an end to this pandemic is not yet in sight? For me, it's been Romans 8, 28. And that's 
probably a familiar verse to many of us. Um, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I think for, for all of us who love God, who have responded to him um, in faith and by God's grace, all things work for good. Like a pandemic is going to work for good. Um, health challenges, he's going to work in that for good. Employment issues, he's going to work in it for our good. Um, me missing going to Latvia for the first time in, I'm not even sure how many years, but many years. This is the first fall I haven't been there. He's working that for his good. Um, even things that are my mess, my mistake, or maybe somebody else's sin against me, that's part of all things. There's nothing that's not part of all things. And so, um, as I can't get away from this verse in the last many weeks, actually, I realized that it's just always going to be win-win for us who love God and who are loved by God. We can't lose. I mean, that doesn't mean we won't suffer and that life won't be hard, but we can't lose. God will work everything that he allows into our life for good. That's an amazing promise. Thank you both. We thank you for the blessing that you provide in the mission field, and we wish you every success in your work ahead. God bless you. Thank you, Joseph, thank you. and the Mamps, and the whole family. We love you guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Joseph, for uh, coming up and uh, on behalf of Mempt and actually speaking to Mo and Wes. Wow, you're actually quite a, a hard interviewer. I'm glad you're not interviewing me, mate. Uh, so, Give yeah, me a chance someday. Yeah, no, no. Uh, uh, and I was going to ask you, like, kind of what was your sense of uh, the elections and stuff, but that would probably take too long. It would. Yeah, it would, it would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, we'll let that one go for a bit, and uh, hopefully we'll get you back up and you can get to interview somebody else at, at another time. Thanks, mate. Okay, thank you. Uh, at you. this time, we are going to, as part of we continue our theme um, of working through songs of praise, hymns that we would love to sing together, uh, but obviously can't be physically together, but we can still sing together as as best we can using the resources we have. Um, and so the song, the hymn this morning, is actually at Now Thank We All Our God, uh, chosen by Ross. And so I've got a recording of this. Um, I think it's from, I think it's actually from the Royal Albert Hall again, if I remember rightly. Uh, and so it's a really old recording. I'm going to ask us all to stand. If you're at home, this is a good opportunity for you to actually get that blood circulating again. Uh, stand and we're going to try and uh, sing together.
have a seat, have a seat. Um, wow, it's like, wouldn't we all love to be uh, part of that, oh, uh, part of that uh, community of faith right there uh, at the Royal Albert Hall? Um, and uh, just singing with uh, hundreds of people. Uh, what an experience that would that would be. Now, thank we all our God that we have the opportunity to meet, to worship, to sing, to pray together. So I invite you, we're going to join together uh, in prayer this morning. Let us bring the needs of the church, the world, and all in need to God's loving care. And so I invite you, please respond to the words, Lord, in your mercy by saying, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Father God, the Lord of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you. Confident then in your love, in your grace, in your mercy, we come together now through the best means that we have these days to offer our prayers to you this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, Lord, we pray for our province as it has just recently voted on, on who should govern us over the next four years. In all likelihood, it will indeed be a majority government for the NDP for John Horgan, who will now be our premier for the next four years. So, Lord, we pray for John and for his party, for all politicians, for all MLAs. We pray that you would grant him and them wisdom. We pray for him particularly that we give him the strength and the guidance to gather courageous leaders around him, that they will do their best for all people in this wonderful province that you created. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in our prayers, we also want to remember and think about the upcoming election in the United States. Although we, as Canadians, are not directly affected by this election, Lord, it's hard to see how it will not have an enormous impact on the world at large. So we pray for wisdom, for grace, for courage. We pray for honesty. We just pray for every single person who votes, who has been voting and who will vote. Lord, I'm struck by that little phrase that appears at the top of the American dollar bill, that we all can see it in our, in our own heads right now. In God we trust. May the people of the United States put their trust, renew their trust in you. I think that's what struck me this morning about Emily's prayer. And that little phrase about those that are distracted, it is so easily easy right now for so many people to be distracted within the United States election. We use Emily's word that the people of the United States would be awakened. And may the vote work in a way that will be the best for their nation and for the good of all people, all nations around this globe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we reflect on both of these elections, we want to remember and pray for the governments of all nations. Move them to set aside their fears their greed, perhaps vain ambition, that all people of all nations will bow 
to your sovereign rule. To inspire all nations to strive individually and collectively for peace and for justice. To raise racial inequalities and prejudices once and for all across this globe. All over our world right now, children are struggling for many reasons. Education is really difficult in these strange times. There are children who are abused in far too many horrendous ways. There are far too many children living in poverty. It's too easy for us to come and just pray that these children would dwell in shalom, free from war and injustice. Lord, we want all children of all nations to have your life breathed into them. that they would be blessed. So guide the leaders and governments, guide all people to come together, to work together, to deal with this global pandemic, to not throw mud and blame others, but to, to put our resources together, to do whatever we can to save lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to be able to see and hear from Mo and Wes Blackman. We pray for them. We pray for Mo as she continues to work with and for the Latvian people. Bless her during these very difficult times. as Mo wants to reach out and teach and share the gospel. Oh, Lord, we know firsthand how hard that is to do across these Zoom services. Yet we pray for each and every Zoom service that Mo's a part of, teaching that she's a part of, all the church services in Latvia. Your name would be praised. People would come to fall in love with you as you love us your kingdom would come. Bless Wes. I know we joked this morning, we find a little bit of humor as his work colleagues call, refer to Wes as the preacher man, but he preaches with his life. Through all of his experiences, trials, tribulations, the joys, the sorrows, keep preaching. Lord, inspire him to keep preaching, to live and to be light and salt for you. So bless this incredible couple. What a privilege it is for us to be part of their journey and help us, Lord, to support them as best we can through these days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we turn our thoughts and prayers to those who are suffering, those that have suffered loss recently, whether it be a loved one, a job, or health diagnosis, or just their security. For those remembering loved ones, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray particularly for the Keir family friends of Nicole and Darren Pringle, as they continue to deal with Lachlan's ongoing cancer diagnosis. Lord, those of us on this call this morning cannot imagine, we really can't, what it would be like to have a grade seven child in our households going through the treatment that he's going through right now so far from home. So be with Ali and Dave. Be with Lachlan's two sisters and brother. And be with Nicole and Darren as they walk alongside this family, as they kneel with this family in prayer,
and in sadness. We want to raise this family to you, Lord, and pray for your healing hand and your healing touch and breath upon Lachlan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we at SAS are a people, a family, brothers and sisters who desire to spend time with each other. We want to gather. We want to sing. We want to get back to normal. I know there are people in this congregation who are reaching out and being part of other services, other church communities, because we're desperate. We're desperate to worship together, to worship among others, to pray, to share life and fellowship. This pandemic is keeping us apart. There are so many people in our community of faith struggling right now. So, Lord, we want to remember and pray for our church elders the leaders of this community of faith, as they seek to hold this tension and this balance between the needs and desires and hopes of this church family with the need to keep people safe. Their desire to make wise, informed choices and to lead us as a family through these times in as cohesive a manner as possible. We lift up to you the leaders of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we want to pray specifically for those we know of who are struggling in our church family. And so this morning, to our church family, I invite everyone to repeat these names. As I say these names aloud, I want you to repeat their names after me, that we together as a community of faith will be lifting up these brothers and sisters to our Lord God. So for those living in long-term care, we want to pray for Dean Scott, Alan Bowen, Jim Hall, Joanne Graham. For those living with long-term debilitating health, we remember and pray and lift up to the living God Liz Lilly, David Forrest, Lorne Dennis, Margaret Williams, Jean Bowen, David Ballantyne, Don Campbell, Kel Kaiser, and Penny McDonald. For those who are lonely, We know, Father, we know the theology. We are never alone because you're always with us. You promised you would never leave us nor forsake us. But during these difficult times, the isolation experienced by so many people right now is being exacerbated. The loneliness is almost crushing people. We pray, Lord, that you would be a real presence in their lives today more than ever before. And Father, we know of others, some who due to their personal decisions don't want us to pray for them publicly by name. So Father, in the silence right now, well, I guess it doesn't have to be silent with us being so far apart. Lord, We're going to take some time now to lift our personal prayers for those we love and cherish and care for, those we know about that are struggling. This cacophony of prayer requests, we lay before you, Lord God. We know you hear all our voices. Let's pray right now. Lord, in your mercy, these prayers we raise to you, our God, our Father, in the name 
of your only son, Jesus Christ. Through the indwelling spirit of the living God. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson uh, for this morning that Ross has actually chosen is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I know we, we tend to give out the reference really quick, and we shouldn't. We should dwell on it a little bit because you're at home. And it's taken me eight months to get to the point to actually remind you to come to these services with a Bible. And I hope you are not only bringing candles and uh, bread and wine for communion, but Bibles every Sunday uh, that we can actually read the text together. So our, our reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 12. And it's right at the end of chapter 5 where you get those final uh, instructions. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 12. Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Let's, let's pray. Father God, what a joy it is for us to gather. What a joy and a privilege it is uh, for us to have Ross with us again this morning. Um, I'm sure life for Ross right now is uh, incredibly difficult um, as he has jumped into this new role as Dean of St. Andrew's Hall this past September and continues to try and lead a college in a time where all the learning is online. He's striving to keep moving the Center for Missional Leadership forward. So Lord, we just want you, you to pour out your blessing upon him, because I know he's blessing so many through his work and his passion for you. So Lord, this morning, we pray that your spirit would now speak through Ross, but that your spirit would Breathe incredible life and strength into Ross as he serves you this day. We look forward to hearing what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, I was going to say it's very, very un, uh, disrespectful for me to invite Dr. Dini to come forward, but um, that just seems the right thing. So, Ross, come forward. Thanks, Marty. Thanks, Marty. Morning, church. It's great to be here with you and to friends online. And uh, Owen is always amazing at uh, receiving last minute technology requests. So uh, including I just sent him some PowerPoint slides for our uh, reflection on the word this morning. And do we get to, well, we get to look at them here in the sanctuary as well. And trust you can see those at home. Don't worry about the big long title. That was me this week in my office having some fun trying to figure out what we're doing with the scripture today. Let's go to the next slide. 
Okay, so I looked it up. Did you realize that today is 61 days till Christmas? 61 days. To <laughs> and I just, I was floored by that. Um, Marty was kind enough to ask me to, to preach a couple of times this fall, about a month ago. And I had Thanksgiving on the brain. It was before Thanksgiving. Uh, and I wanted to work with a Thanksgiving uh, text partly because I thought it's just so hard for many of us to, to get into the spirit of Thanksgiving uh, in a global pandemic eight months on when we're kind of being worn down bit by bit. Uh, and then I realized, oh my goodness, if we have trouble with Thanksgiving, Christmas is coming. Uh, once a week during the beginning of the pandemic through St. Andrew's Hall, we are hosting uh, Zoom calls for pastoral leaders. This fall, we've gone to monthly gatherings. Pastor Martin was on the call uh, this week, and I was just setting up details for next month's call, and the theme is a very merry COVID Christmas next month. Getting pastoral leaders, uh, moderator of the General Assembly, Amanda Curry, is going to speak to us about ideas of, of how to celebrate, celebrate Christmas in this difficult and challenging time. Who would have thought a year ago that we would be talking about a very merry COVID Christmas? Who would have thought a year ago that small turkeys would be sold out at Thanksgiving and big turkeys, the kind you have to wrestle someone in the Safeway aisle for, were left in abundance the day after Thanksgiving? This is a, a scripture reading that we are looking at today that I would suggest gives us some clues as to how to wrestle with the theme of thanksgiving for us as disciples during this very challenging time. Let's go to the next slide, please, Owen. So I was in uh, Thessaloniki where uh, this letter is directed a couple of years ago, leading a, a pilgrimage tour in the footsteps of Paul uh, as we crisscross Turkey and Greece and uh, Italy. Thessaloniki, it's about uh, 500 kilometers north of Athens. Today, it, it is the second largest city uh, in all of Greece, and it's famous for its uh, 15th century white tower that you see depicted here. I don't know about you, growing up in Manitoba, every Greek restaurant had like a huge picture of the white tower. It was kind of the thing to do. And the thing is, uh, the city today What's, um, uh, if you go further east from there, you hit Philippi. And that's the next slide, Owen, if you go to that one. So this, there's not much left of Philippi today, but when I took the group there, you have to know something of Philippi to get a sense of the importance of what the Bible calls Thessalonica in that day, Thessaloniki today. There is, you can see the Apostle Paul depicted uh, we had a time of worship and uh, marked the spot where they believe the, the holding cell was for Paul and Silas in prison. You remember the story of uh, when he was uh, in prison, the earthquake, jail opens up, but they continue to sing hymns of praise. The jailer comes in and is just uh, amazed that they're still there. He thought he'd have to take his own life rather than face the consequences. And as a result, his entire family is baptized in that place. Even more impressive than Philippi is a, just a couple of kilometers away is a traditional site where Paul met that a famous businesswoman for a pension, with a penchant for purple, Lydia. And there uh, he uh, baptizes Lydia and we see conversions happening. Now, the reason this part of the story is so important is you recall Paul was in Troas earlier and he had the Macedonian call and followed through on that call, bringing the gospel to Europe for the first time. I think it worked, right? If you look back in church history. And so when he gets to, um, to meeting Lydia and having that uh, conversion moment with Lydia, there's been some recent scholarship done. Uh, I was reading... A little while back, a guy named David Campbell, who teaches at Duke Divinity School, is a, a really good book. It's a huge book out called Paul and Apostles' Journey. And in it, he has a chapter where he looks more closely at Lydia 
And one of the things drawing on uh, the ancient understanding of the trade guilds and that kind of thing, he makes the claim that it's most likely that Paul as a leather worker, a tent maker, is how he paid for some of his ministry as he traveled around, as you know. It's likely that it was Lydia as a qualified businesswoman who traveled the Via Ignatia all across the Roman Empire. She basically gave him all of her contacts in the markets. And so as he works his way further west, Thessalonica, Bera, Athens, Corinth, it's her letter of recommendation that gets him into the marketplaces. And so uh, after Philippi, that's exactly where he goes next, is on to Thessalonica, essentially following Lydia's uh, trade route. And in Thessalonica, and this is um, the city when he arrives, it's a huge city for uh, biblical times. Uh, today, Thessalonica, uh, Thessaloniki, the, the larger city, is like a million people. Kind of like Greater Vancouver is what now? Three million. But the city of Vancouver, if we go over Lionsgate, is only 610,000. Well, the city, the actual downtown city part of Thessaloniki, is only 100,000 larger in population than when Paul was there. It's 300,000 today. When Paul was there 2,000 years ago, 200,000 people lived in the city. It was a massive city, bustling place for business and so forth. And as we read in the book of Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas arrive in the city and they start preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. Paul, a faithful Jew and Torah scholar, would begin by proclaiming the resurrection in a local synagogue. We can go to the next slide, Owen. If rejected from there, uh, or as in Athens, uh, in the same chapter of Acts later on, if he doesn't just simply gain ground there, he goes to other places, marketplaces, or where there are philosophical debates taking place. In Thessaloniki, Paul at first receives a very warm welcome, both from the Jewish community, the book of Acts tells us, uh, and then also from so-called uh, prominent citizens, including prominent women in the Bible, likely um, the spouses of civic leaders and so forth. But after three weeks, there's a problem, and people are getting irritated about his claims of Jesus as Messiah, and a mob is stirred up, and they go to Jason's house, likely where Paul and Silas were staying. He lets them escape out of the city, and he kind of holds the crowd at bay and takes one for the team for them. From there, they head on to, Paul goes on to Athens and then to Corinth, and from Corinth, then he writes this letter back. He's trying to communicate uh, how to hold this fragile new community of faith together during this difficult time. Paul's words surely were welcome to the people in Thessaloniki at that time. These new believers in Christ who from the very start had such a terrible experience of being persecuted for their faith, at times unable to meet together for fear of their health, uncertain about the future. Next slide, Owen. Friends, we know what it feels like, too, to be in uncertain times. We are now into our eighth month, as we mentioned earlier, of a global pandemic that has fundamentally changed so much of how we live our lives. We, too, have been frightened to gather, and even when we do, it's different than before with our masks and hand sanitizer and social distance as we have here in the sanctuary. It can be easy to be shaken and uncertain about the future. I was sharing with Pastor Martin earlier a blog post by a theologian I like named Andy Crouch. His main book is called Culture Making. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, he wrote this lovely blog post where he was reflecting and he said, okay, we know all of us were in a storm. No one's doubting that. But he said, what kind of storm is it? First, he said, it could be a blizzard. We're in a blizzard, and coming from the prairies and those in the congregation here and online who have grown up in the prairies, we know blizzards, right? They are intense, short-lived storms that you can eventually dig yourself out of, right? After a couple of days, you finally dig yourself out. Is, is that what this storm is? It doesn't appear to be. So his second option is, well, if it's not a blizzard, 
then it's a season. It's a protracted time in which we have this constant uh, reality. It's possible that we're in the season of COVID winter. And then he said a third option is it could be a mini ice age where things are fundamentally changed as a result. And the point that he made that was most important to me is he said not knowing what it is causes even more anxiety. And I think that's what I see in my students, in my staff at the college, uh, in other pastors that I talk to as I um, uh, preach in different churches, mostly online now in different parts of the country, is this uncertainty is fueling our anxiety. How, how does it feel for you? How are you experiencing this storm? So whether in church or society, we're all asking these questions about the uncertain and fearful time we find ourselves in. So how to respond? Next slide, Owen. Well, Paul sends this letter to the little church in Thessalonica and pours out blessing upon the Christians in the city, who he knew, as you heard earlier, just a short period of time, just a handful of weeks. I mean, imagine trying to plant a church in three weeks and then you get out of town, right? Paul reminds them that he and his missionary friends remember them regularly in prayer. Their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in the first chapter of this letter, he commends them for the way in which they are imitating Christ and that the witness of their faith, in fact, has spread. This little fragile house church, people are talking about their faithfulness under times of pressure and anxiety in Macedonia. And then he uses a phrase we don't really use anymore, Achaia, which is like greater Vancouver. That just means uh, all of Athens and Corinth. Everyone's talking about the Thessalonian Christians. Then he gives them clear instructions in the reading that Pastor Martin offered us this morning. It's a series of imperatives that one New Testament scholar said is kind of like a shotgun. It's just like these imperatives are, are shooting out one after the other. It's exhausting. The three that I want us to focus on in our teaching time today. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, could Paul really mean that? Like, always? Really? Joyful always? Pray always? Give thanks always? Really? I mean, it's not like the Apostle Paul was lacking experience on what a tough day on the job looked like, right? And the people receiving the letter also knew what it meant to have a tough day following Jesus. And yet there it is, always joyful. Pray at all times. Give thanks in all circumstances. How is that possible? How can we be joyful sometimes, perhaps? Maybe we could renegotiate this. Could we be joyful sometimes? Could we just pray when you can? Give thanks when things are going well. Maybe that's a better compromise. Next slide, please. I was reading uh, earlier this month a delightful book by Craig Barnes. I like Craig Barnes a lot. He's both president of uh, Princeton Seminary, um, but also a true pastor. In fact, when he was in Pittsburgh, he was a faculty member at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and he was the pastor at Shadyside Presbyterian Church at the same time. That's the church that gave us the tradition of Worldwide Communion Sunday under Dr. Kerr. In his latest book, Diary of a Pastor, he reflects on the impact of his third grade Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Williams, who taught most Bible stories using, you guessed it, and see it here, flannel graph board. How many of us in the church uh, were taught, yeah, I was, yeah, flannel graph, love it. Okay, here's what he writes. Whenever the apostle Paul was used in one of Mrs. Williams' stories, uh, she took a lot of extra time smoothing out the character beneath her fingers. That's because the Apostle Paul had been overused in the stories on the flannel graph board. One of her greatest delights, Barnes writes as kids, was getting to hand Mrs. Williams the next character to be placed on her flannel graph. One day, he recalls, Johnny Burke and I fought over who would have this high honor and our tugging against each other tore the little Apostle's head right off. So he was taped together. And some other kids, I'm thinking it was those 
outsiders in Vacation Bible School, he writes, spilled purple Kool-Aid all over him. But Mrs. Williams couldn't stop using the apostle in his stories. He just kept, he kept coming up too often in the biblical dramas. And then in a classic turn of phrase, uh, this classic Barnes, the trap door opens and you go deeper, he writes this. In fact, Mrs. Williams was proclaiming to the children in her class a holy mystery she never intended to communicate. God is not easy on the people he uses in holy drama. By the end of their lives, even the best of them were taped together and discolored. Paul had been chased out of half the cities of the Roman Empire by the end of his life, typically with a shower of rocks behind him. But when he wrote one of his last letters to the Philippians from jail, all he wanted to talk about was his surpassing joy. I think that's because his life's delight was that he got used in holy drama. Next slide. Yet Paul knows that the Thessalonians were caught up in that holy drama too, and so presses on towards an important truth. The worship of God is in the context of all life, not just the part we devote to God here on a Sunday morning. The ability to rejoice in good times and bad is not grounded in our ability to be positive thinkers, but rather uh, it is an awareness of the presence and the goodness of God that accompanies us. Earlier uh, this month, I participated in a book launch for a pastor who's a church planter at St. Peter's Fireside in downtown Vancouver named Alistair Stern. He's been doing some work with his congregation over the years. It's an interesting congregation made up mostly of young professionals living in the downtown core. They meet at uh, UBC's uh, downtown campus. And as he was trying to um, teach, as he was trying to catechize these mostly secular urban young professionals, he discovered that what he needed to do was to introduce them to a rule of life. How do you help someone who has no background in church figure out what it means to follow Jesus? A little bit like what Paul was doing as he was planting these churches. And instead of a rule of life, he calls it a rhythm of life. Because a rule of life is too stringent, it's too strict, things change. And he gives examples of becoming a father and not being able to to pray in the regimented way that he did before, and so forth. In the book launch and in the book, Alistair reflects on his struggles in following Jesus with his own mental health and his own depression, and how oftentimes in uh, the most darkest moments of his life, he's tried to keep a gratitude journal. And some days it would be as simple as thanking God just for being alive that day. I love the rawness with which he writes in the book and the honesty about how hard times are. This is not a, a kind of pasting on a happy Christian smile. There's um, a real honesty to the challenges. Next slide, Owen. Let's keep that in mind when we look at the first imperative, to pray always. In some ways, it sounds exhausting, even dangerous, if you see people crossing the road on their iPhone almost getting hit by cars. You don't want to pray with your eyes closed, right? Crossing streets. If by prayer we mean head down, uh, you know, uh, a bowed head, folded hands, closed eyes, those are just customs of prayer, not prayer itself. Prayer, of course, is communication with God. And here the apostle is imploring us to pray always, to always be in communication and awareness of God's presence. Or as Catholic theologian Karl Rahner once wrote, everyday life, must become itself our prayer. Imperatives to rejoice and to be in communication with God throughout our day leads to this third imperative, right? So that we, we have the sense of rejoicing always, but we want to acknowledge, like Alistair Stern, sometimes it's hard. We want to pray always, and we recognize that's just part of awareness with God's life. But what about this third imperative? To be in communication with God uh, leads to, in everything, give thanks, as one translation puts it. Note the Bible doesn't ask us to give thanks for everything. I've even found some translations that say that, and I cringe a bit, but rather to give thanks in everything. I think there's an important distinction there. It's an especially strong word of encouragement and direction for us right now in month eight of the pandemic. 
Many of us are struggling with grief and isolation, job loss, financial worries, mental health concerns, a growing sense of frustration, all that Pastor Martin was just praying for in our prayer time earlier. We are not called to give thanks for the pandemic reality, I would argue. We are called to give thanks in the midst of this time. As those saved to be sent as witnesses, our rejoicing, our praying, our giving thanks marks us as followers of the crucified and risen Lord. Commenting on this third imperative, the great preacher uh, Charles Spurgeon wrote this. I love this. When joy and prayer are married, their firstborn child is gratitude. It's a beautiful phrase. And in the end, everything in our, in our creaturely life should be directed towards doxology and praise of Father, Son, and Spirit. Paul reminds them that this threefold imperative is rooted in the will of God, and that is what God wants and we are to follow. We're not left alone to figure out God's will. Think about the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I was looking up uh, this week, and in one section it talks about Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us the will of God for our salvation. It's Jesus himself who comes alongside us and helps us understand what God's will is as we practice these. Next slide, Owen. Perhaps the most challenging thing on Thanksgiving this week when I was putting this message together was I was reading John Calvin's commentary on this passage and it's the first time I've ever heard anyone describe Thanksgiving as limitation. Stick with me here. This is important. Calvin writes, Thanksgiving, as I have said, is added as a limitation. For many pray in such a manner as at the same time to murmur against God, right? Like prayers about what's not right and that kind of thing. And fret themselves if he does not immediately gratify their wishes. But on the contrary, it is befitting that our desire should be restrained in such a manner that contented with what is given, we always, I just love this phrase, mingle thanksgiving with our desires. I think that's profound. He writes, we may lawfully, it is true, ask, nay, sigh, lament, but it must be in such a way that the will of God is more acceptable to us than our own. Friends at SAS, what if in the week ahead, every time we went to pray, we could mingle thanksgiving with our desires? That to me is such a, a profound, profound command. Another imperative coming to us. The Thessalonians were encouraged to hear not only from Paul, but to hear how the steadfast love of the Lord Jesus was being made known through the fact that they were mingling thanksgiving with their desires. Living during a time of pandemic is stressful, it is worrisome, but we are not the first Christians to face these kinds of challenges. But what we do with the time God gives us now is critical. Will we turn away from God in fear or anger, selfish desire, or will we turn towards God in thanksgiving and gratitude? Now, this is a sermon series on songs of praise, and you may be wondering, well, where is the hymn that we sang so beautifully? And what a great video that was, although it may be a little uncomfortable to see all those people in a super spreader environment, right? But that was from years ago, just in case you're wondering. That was not a recent concert in the UK. Growing up on the Canadian prairies, we can go to the next slide there, Owen. Uh, growing up in the Canadian prairies, our Thanksgiving services would always have the sanctuary crowded with farm fresh produce in from the fields. No matter what the year, we'd always sing in our Thanksgiving services, the classic hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. Earlier this month, I was putting a message together for residents of St. Andrew's Hall. We canceled our Thanksgiving dinner we always have. We did a little video thing for them. And I was struck when researching the origins of the hymn to discover that it was written by a Martin Reinhardt, who is both a minister and a musician in Germany during the Thirty Years' War. We can go to the next slide. It has a picture of him, actually, quite a handsome gentleman with a nice collar. There he is. The city was full of plague. I didn't know this about this hymn. The, the guy who wrote this was a minister in a city overcome by pandemic. I read that this minister who wrote this hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, that we sing so cheerfully, was actually, at the time he wrote this hymn, the last minister alive in the city. All the other clergy had died of plague. 
and he was doing 50 funerals a day. And he sits down, and he writes this. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done, in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Those words, 1,500 years after the Thessalonians were recognized for their faithfulness and given Paul's directions to rejoice, pray, and give thanks, and yet his words of thanksgiving in the midst of difficult times continues in the same vein. So, 500 years on from that hymn, how about us? Might we add our voices to the communion of saints who sing God's praise at this very moment, that in these days and weeks after Thanksgiving, we too might claim the gift of the Holy Spirit that brings joy in the midst of sorrow. If so, then God is pouring out his love on us, even here, even now, for the work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, and endurance inspired by hope. As we rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks. Let us pray. God, in these difficult times, we turn to you. We recognize our limitations. And yet we also hear your clear imperatives issued from Scripture from the quill of the Apostle Paul under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so we do not turn away. As those following you in this time and this place, we ask that in this week ahead, that as we express those worries, those concerns, those needs that are all very real, that you might mingle with those petitions, thanksgiving, so that we might trust in you, and that we might follow you into a future that you command. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do I have to do that all again, Owen? Uh, thanks, Ross. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have my mic uh, on at the minute, Owen, so just using the lectern. Yes, I just wanted to say thanks to Ross. And just before we leave, we got a couple of quick announcements. And that is that the shoe boxes were given out yesterday at the church hall by MEMT. Um, if you haven't picked up one, please contact the church office this week swing by the office in the mornings and we should be able to get one to you um, because we would like to make every effort to fill as many of these as we can to bless the kids. Uh, next Saturday night on the day that shall not be named, uh, it's a bit like a Harry Potter uh, book, um, is uh, our hot chocolate on the lawn. It's not really on the lawn. We're actually going to meet just direct outside the front door of the church uh, as socially distanced and safe as possible, but still going to bless uh, the neighborhood. Uh, I drove up the road yesterday and they are preparing. If you've never been on the street before uh, um, October 31st, um, it is really quite a sight to see the effort that these people are, are making um, for next Saturday night. And I know the current environment, they're still Bonnie Henry has basically said it's an outdoor event, small groups, so she's not giving any more direction. So we're, we're going to gather and bless the people as they're out on a cold night and, uh, and give them some hot chocolate. Next Saturday night, uh, your clocks fall back. So please remember that. Your clocks are going to go back next Saturday night before the Sunday morning service. And next Sunday morning service will be a communion service. So make sure you have your bread and wine prepared. It's been a blessing to be with you this morning, uh, to be worshiping together. Uh, thanks to all those that were involved in the service this morning. 
and it just uh, leaves me to um, bless you all as we go. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and blessing and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and your loved ones this day, this week, uh, and the many weeks that lie ahead. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday.